Many thanks for joining into our Sydney Institute's um, meetings at a time of pandemic. So obviously Zoom meetings, and it's got a downside. You can't, we can't all be in the same room together. It's got an upside because uh, a lot of our supporters who live outside of Sydney can now join in and they're always very welcome. So we're going to be very brief. I'll introduce our, we have a lot of people on the, on the, on the call today. So any comments, questions got to be very brief. We're going to lead off with Andrew West, and then we're going to go to Geraldine Duke, then we'll have questions and discussion. We'll finish no later than the top of the hour. Um, just a reminder to keep muted unless you're speaking, and the email sent out to you this morning indicates how you can ask a question or make a comment. Now, so the topic today is Christianity Today, a time of crisis. Um, we've got two very well-known commentators, so I'll start off with Andrew West, who's going to leave off lead off. So Andrew's an author of several books and, and many papers in recent times on religion, but books on other matters as well. And of course, presents the Religion Report on ABC Radio National, a very important program. Geraldine Dug is also an author. She presents Saturday Extra uh, on Radio National, uh, which I always listen to, and also occasionally uh, presents Compass on ABC TV. So we're going to lead off with Andrew. We're going to go to Geraldine and then questions and discussion. So it's over to you, Andrew, and many thanks. Uh, my pleasure, Jared. And um, this is the third time I've had the chance to speak at the Sydney Institute over the last 20 years. Um, you know, Jared is a very old friend. We go back over 30 years. Uh, Jared used to have, or probably still does, this wonderful collection of historic political documents. And when I was an undergraduate, I called him up and I asked if I could read these. And he said, you can't take them. He said, but you can come to my house, which was a lovely old house in Hornsby, and you can spend as much time. And I spent several Saturdays at Jared's house in Hornsby and Anne used to bring me lunch. So <laughs> I've always had a very fond memory of Jared and Anne and their kindness. And even when Jared remonstrates with me publicly, which is periodic, I am always happy to remember that. Um, and I was happy to do the, I see some, a lot of friends here, uh, Terry Sheehan and uh, Peter Curty, um, Milton Cockburn. Uh, I think my friend Sue Hooker's here. Um, so it's great to be able to talk to you. Now, this is census week. So right now, millions of Australians are sort of being asked the question, are you now, or have you ever been a member of a Christian church? <laughs> um, and I fully expect the answer next year to be less than 52%, which was what the uh, number of uh, professing or self-identifying Christians was uh, in the 2016 census. This does not surprise me. And people like uh, our mutual friend, Greg Sheridan, have been saying for some years that Australia is an atheist country. I think Greg, uh, of whom I'm enormously fond, and he's written a wonderful new book, but I think Greg overstates that. I think Australia's for Christianity in Australia, the greatest danger is not atheism or aggression, it is relevance. That's something, for example, that Dr. Michael Jensen, who's a theologian and a Sydney Anglican has written. He doesn't sense that we are no longer in a, a moment of triumph for, if you like, the new atheist movement. And oddly enough, um, some a couple of years ago, I interviewed Helen Pluckrose, uh, who was a, who's a sort of a, a heterodox left winger who spoke at the Ramsey Centre and wrote a wonderful book. And uh, Helen herself was part of the New Atheist Movement about 10, 12 years ago, but she wasn't keen to talk about that. Uh, for, she wanted to talk about her book, but I said I should mention it in passing. She said, yes, but Andrew, you can only talk for so long about what you don't believe in. So in that sense, I think that movement has had its day. But nonetheless, uh, faith in Australia is challenged by a sense of indifference. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. There is a lot of hostility directed at the institutional church. And Geraldine will speak, I think, on a quite personal level about this. And we cannot look past the tragedy of the abuse crisis. And that is a terrible self-inflicted wound. And it has enabled a lot of uh, mobilization against organized religion. But interestingly, 
And I take this from something that Greg wrote in his book. A lot of critics of the church use the moral terms of religion to condemn religion and I think quite, or to condemn the church. They use its own terms to condemn the church and I think quite correctly at times. So for example, during the Royal Commission, uh, when I would interview a critic of the church, and there were many, quite obviously, the refrain that I heard, and anecdotal evidence is not always the most valuable, but when you hear it 30 or 40 times, it begins to form a pattern. And the comment was often along the lines of, imagine what Jesus would think. Now, that to me does not suggest someone angry with Christianity. It suggests to me people deeply hurt by what they see as the betrayal of Christianity by the church. That is a very different thing to uh, a sort of triumphalism that many uh, atheists will claim coming out, for example, of the expected census results. So I expect the census results to put uh, Christianity at somewhere below 50% uh, when the results come out next year. This follows a trend of secularization that has been going on for 50 years since the 60s. It has been accelerated by the self-inflicted crisis of the, uh, of the sexual abuse scandal. But, there's, but even without that, this trend was going on. Um, in March this year, uh, the Gallup group in the United States had what for the United States was an absolutely shattering figure. For the first time in polling history, fewer than 50% of Americans claimed membership of a church, mosque or synagogue, it was 47%. Now, this is very interesting because it's not as simple as people might think. It is not necessarily a renunciation of religion, but it is, it is a nervousness, it is an anxiousness, it is a reluctance to identify. For example, white evangelicalism, because it's become such a loaded phrase, a politically loaded phrase, the number of people who identify as white evangelicals has fallen from 19% to 16%, not a massive drop, but a significant drop. And if you're a Southern Baptist or a member of the uh, Presbyterian Church of, I think it's PCA, which is the, um, uh, the conservative wing of the Presbyterians, or you're a Missouri Synod Lutheran, uh, all, all of which would consider themselves part of the broad white evangelical community, these are not good numbers for you. But again, this is a question of identification. It is not a question of belief. And there's a great mistake that's made in assuming that uh, people who don't identify institutionally now with a religion have given up on religion. I just go back to my earlier point. I think many of them sense a great sense of betrayal. And many of the church leaders, I think, recognize this. Uh, for example, before the 2019 election, the Catholic Bishops Conference of Australia put out what I thought was an extremely honest and very humble statement where we said, we realize we have no credibility to instruct Australians on how to vote. We simply ask them to consider a range of issues. And along with the traditional issues regarding the sanctity of life, most of what the Catholic bishops asked us to consider or asked voters to consider when voting were things like poverty, the treatment of asylum seekers, um, the future of health care. So I think there is a realisation um, that religion or that Christianity in Australia and the West is becoming a large, Greg Sheridan says it should be a large and confident, but a minority nonetheless. However, the situation around the world in the global South and East Asia is extraordinarily different. There are, I think, 680 million people in Africa who identify as Christian. By 2030, I think something like 40% of the world's Christians will be in Africa. In China, the number of Christians is anywhere between 70 million and 150 million. Now, I acknowledge that 150 million is likely to be at the most optimistic end. But in a country that has ruthlessly oppressed Christianity since 1949, um, even to have something like 70 million Christians is an extraordinary 
uh, is an extraordinary accomplishment for the Christian faith. The Catholic Church has, I think, between 10 and 15 million uh, adherents in China. This has led to some controversy because Pope Francis has been trying to negotiate some form of arrangement with the Chinese communist government to allow it to have some more, some more freedoms for Chinese Catholics, but that does involve allowing the Chinese Communist Party to approve bishops, and this has led to a lot of pushback. This puts the Pope, and I, you know, I don't, I, I, I try not to allow personal, um, uh, personal opinion to intrude on the program, but people wouldn't be the first to say that I, I do, they do sense some warmth that I have to Pope Francis. Uh, it puts Pope Francis in a very difficult position because he, he sees the massive growth of Christianity in China, and he obviously wants Catholicism to have a have a piece of that. That's fair enough. But that may involve something Faustian with the uh, with the um, the Chinese Communist Party, um, and of course the other great area of growth for uh, the particularly the evangelical and Protestant churches and the Pentecostal churches is in Latin America. Around the world, there's something like 500 million Pentecostals. 500 million Pentecostals. Now, there's a deep misunderstanding, particularly among a lot of journalists and um, people on the so-called progressive side of politics ex about, for example, Pentecostalism in Australia. Um, I am not uncritical of our prime minister, but I'm not one of those people who, who, you know, who, who has a, some sort of guttural reaction against our prime minister's uh, uh, Pentecostal faith. I think it's deeply misunderstood. Pentecostalism in this country is nothing like white evangelical Protestantism in the United States. It certainly has some core uh, conservative, socially conservative values, but it is deeply misread as some sort of outgrowth of the white Christian evangelical right in the United States. Even the most casual survey of uh, a Pentecostal congregation in this country would reveal something much different, would reveal and anyone who was listening to my program just uh, 30 minutes ago would have heard this. Um, Pentecostal congregations in this country are in many ways models of modern multicultural Australia. I should say that is increasingly the case with a lot of Catholic parishes as well. If anything is keeping the numbers in Catholic churches steady, if not up, it is immigrants from South Asia, from the Philippines, from China, from Vietnam. If anything is... Uh, if anything is keeping alive the flagging uniting church, it is the congregations of the South Pacific. And interestingly, the uniting church has just elected as its national leader, as its moderator, I think the first Pacific Islander who was a female pastor. So there's a lot of misunderstanding in this country about Pentecostalism. I don't go into the details of its theology, but if, I, if you look at it as a social force, it's something very, very different. And political leaders in this country, particularly on the left, would be, would be very wary, I think, of trying to characterise this very fast growing religion. It is still coming off a very small base, but they would be very wary, I think, or should be very wary of characterising Pentecostalism in necessarily negative terms. The politicisation, though, of Christianity in the US has been, I think, a real problem for it the growing association of white evangelicalism with just one political party, I think is a very bad uh, development for white evangelicalism, for any form of Christianity. And I know that in Australia, uh, a lot of evangelical leaders and Pentecostal leaders are very eager not to be owned by one political party. And I think that is a wise thing that they, that they pursue. So the politicization of Christianity is, I think, something that's in some countries has been to its great disadvantage. That is not, of course, to say that our faith leaders have no right to uh, to make their arguments. We live in I, I don't we live in a, a country of secular governance, but we live in a country of religious and ethnic pluralism. And that is a big difference. We, we have secular governance, which is entirely appropriate, but we are a religiously and ethnically plural country. 
and it is entirely appropriate that faith leaders are able to contribute to that debate. For those people, and I'm happy to take some questions, obviously, but in conclusion, there's a very interesting statistic. And again, this comes out of a conversation that I had based on Greg Sheridan's book. And it looks at the way Christianity has ebbed and flowed through recent history. And uh, Greg takes us back to 1750 in London. And it's 1750 on the streets of London. There are 10,000 prostitutes working the streets. At Easter time, in the great mother church, if unofficially the mother church of Anglicanism, St. Paul's Cathedral, there are 16 people worshipping. <laughs> 16 people worshipping. What then happened? Within three decades, the great Wesleyan revival had begun. It ebbed again a little bit in the mid-1800s. There was a second revival, mainly based around the United States. There was a revival when the Tractarians, uh, taking the lead of, uh, of, of, of Cardinal uh, Newman uh, and uh, Pusey, uh, revived the Anglo-Catholic wing of the, uniting ch of the Anglican Church. It's weak nowadays. It's... <laughs> Uh, for lack of anything else, it's my wing of the Anglican Church, but nonetheless, for many decades, it was a vital, vibrant partner in the Church of England. As Peter, Hutch, uh, as Peter, uh, uh, Peter Hitchens records in some marvellous writing that he's done, Christianity weakened in Europe after World War I. Its association with the call to war, the call to arms was very damaging for it. And then again, Christianity had another heyday in the West, in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s. It's interesting, however, to note that in Australia, uh, Christianity never uh, could claim more than 50% weekly church attendance. I think it was the late 40s or early 50s when we got to something like 47, 48% weekly or, or fortnightly church attendance. But nonetheless, these figures today are very sobering for the Christian churches and Christian leaders in the West, but they are not hopeless. They are not hopeless. And it is on that that I want to leave us. There is just one final point that I would make. Uh, and it is a challenge for both conservatives and liberals in the Christian churches. And uh, for example, Sue Hook would know this because she heard me speaking about this about uh, two years ago when Sue invited me to speak to a very large group of wonderful people uh, on the, on the, uh, on the lower North shore at a wonderful dinner they had. There's, there's two challenges. One is for conservative Christians and conservative Christian leaders, hardline, hardline Christian theology does simply not meet people where they are in their lives. It is pointless saying to uh, a single mother who has had many travails in her life that she has made some grievous error and is cut off from the sacraments of the church and the love of the church. It is, it is, it is, a, it is a, an impossible way to meet people where they are in their lives. At the same time, though, liberals in the church cannot practice what I think is the theology of evasion or the theology of avoidance. Many liberal or progressive Christian leaders today, when asked about the tough stuff to do with matters of life and death, euthanasia, abortion, questions about um, the sanctity of life, about traditional marriage, will simply say, yes, but the Bible contains 2,000 references to the poor and 12 references to homosexuality. That may be the case, but it doesn't help to avoid the tough stuff. The challenge for Christian leaders is to be both pastoral, but also faithful to their doctrines, but it is to do so in a way that recognizes the reality of modern life. Uh, I'll leave you. I'll leave that with you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Many thank you. Uh, many thanks, Andrew. So we go to Geraldine. Geraldine, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jared. And um, look, I'm I'm going to take up uh, the institute's invitation in a pretty personal way. Um, I, I left the the nice broad overview to Andrew, um, but I do think some of the solutions that I proposed. I think could be applied broadly, um, not just to the Catholic Church of, the, of Australia, which is what I know so well, but I just didn't think I could approach this without focusing on the agonies of this particular part of Australian life. 
I want to quote in Greg Craven in his inimitable style in the Weekend Australian two years ago, three years ago, I think it is now. Have things ever seemed worse for the Catholic Church in Australia? If it were a boxer, it would look tangled in the ropes, sliding towards the canvas, spitting blood. The past four years have been horrendous, endless, horrifying accounts of historical child abuse, a Royal Commission relentlessly critiquing failures, the media baying for yet more blood. How much worse can this get? Now, you know, that's pretty tough to read. Can I offer, because I seek them out, a counter to those sentiments? When you climb out a black well, you are not the same. You come to, in the blue air, with a long, sore scar circling your chest like the shoreline of a deep new sea. Your hands are webbed, inviting you to trust yourself in water stranger and wilder than you've ever known. Your heart has a kick. Your eyes have a different bite. You have emerged from some dark wonder you can't explain. You are not the same. Now, that's the memorable work of the late Dorothy Porter in a poem called Not the Same. And I happen to believe it does offer Catholics some psychological, maybe even spiritual roadmap to trust that the church can indeed emerge, not dissimilar to what Andrew is saying, but not on the same terms, but to trust yourself uh, as a layperson to have emerged differently as well. Um, I do take some comfort that far away from the considerations of the secular world and its impact, People belonging to a range of institutions that have put under the most incredible focus in this world, from banks to police forces, to political parties, to sporting clubs, know that feeling of being gutted by what is emerging, often very much um, against uh, the intentions of the institution, uh, of discovering some behaviour unknown to yourself, but fundamentally shifting your own and the community's view of the institution to which you've devoted a lot of your life. It, it, it is a terrific, it, it's a very demanding moment. The church is going through a dark night of the soul, that's for sure, probably of a different order to some of those other institutions I'm talking about because it actually stands to offer a glimpse of the divine, uh, certainly broader meaning much more than the products may be on offer from, although there are services on offer too, and those other institutions that I cited. And look, I think that we Catholics in particular had that sense that, look, someone's running it, aren't they? Um, it'll keep turning somehow. We turn up as lay people, we offer our attendance and maybe a bit more. But like our personal circulation system, uh, it would work miraculously, somehow. And we knew, we knew that the church represented far more than the awful stories, that we knew that 700,000 school children were educated in the Catholic sector, served by around 80,000 staff, around 66 hospitals, including 19 public hospitals uh, run by church-related entities. That was also part of the story. Massive hubs of compassion there. The Vincent de Paul Society is the most extensive volunteer welfare network in the country. The church, the largest welfare provider outside government. The largest welfare provider outside government. <laughs> you know, most people don't know that, including Catholics, I might add. All that evidence, though, doesn't necessarily settle me now as an Australian Catholic, um, because I... I know that it does have to, something more has to occur in what is asked of my fellow Catholics in the immediate future. And I am consciously asking what is asked of me. I had a quite powerful, if poignant experience at mass in my local church long ago now, it seems like that anyway, um, listening to a, a young, highly intelligent Australian Vietnamese priest recently ordained transparently devout and super conscientious. His homily emphasis quite surprised me because he very much saw himself as leading us, his words, um, or the, the shepherd, I suppose, fair enough, the good shepherd, but he was going to be the clear guide the people in, to the people in the pews through the thickets of life towards a greater faith. 
And there was this moment, which frankly brought tears to my eyes, when he said, I pray every day, dear people, I took it down, that I will be up to the task, that I will resist all temptations and fulfil my mission, or something like that. I could see his total commitment, and of course I was impressed, but I wanted to say to him something like, I, I wish you'd said, I will be there to accompany you. I will walk alongside you and hope to never deviate, and I hope you'll walk with me as we all attempt together to discern God's path for us and our church here in Australia, or something like that. And it made me realise, as I sat there, profoundly moved, that I had really moved. I, Geraldine, had moved to a very different model of both priesthood and church, um, and that is very much still underway, entirely derived from Vatican II and the whole notion of a pilgrim a pilgrim church. I heard one man recently say, I refuse any longer. He, think, he thinks that language is very important. I refuse to use the word father, father this, father that. I will use, I will refer to the priests as pastors, which is respectful, but it fulfilled a different role in that man's imagination. And I, I thought that was quite a clever thing. There's a very good new book I'll show you here called, that has just come out, Leadership in a Synodal Church um, by Anne Benjamin and F Charles Burford. It reflects on this word clericalism, which you might recall the Royal Commission identified primarily as a major issue, the culture of clericalism, which they felt had really served the Roman Catholic Church very poorly. Now, the authors say clericalism can't be equated with clerics per se, it relates to behaviours, language, attitudes exhibited by some clergy, reinforced by others of the faithful. One par parish priest described it as attitudes of exception, entitlement and exemption. Exception, entitlement and exemption. Definitely not a suite of temperamental styles designed to suit a secular culture of the 21st century. But of course, we know that <laughs> the church is far more than those clerical behaviours far more. But I, I just feel that what it asks of us, and I'm just watching the time, is, and how we sort our way through these demanding years, I have sought out, I hope, surprising areas of hope and energy, because passivity is not going to cut it. We've got to go into our own search. And I want to quote a German writer, the deputy editor of Der Spiegel, Dirk Kirpjewit, who was in Australia a few years back when I read, read this, and I've never, I've took it down again, and it always seems to affect modern Catholics when you say it. He was talking about, he came on my show, and he was talking about the modern German mood post their 20th century cataclysms, because I've always been intrigued in a way, you know, how did they rebuild themselves, speaking of identity and, uh, you know, belief? This is what he said. Germans once believed they'd found a saviour, but then he tried to destroy the world, and now their belief in salvation has vanished. The sociologist Helmut Schleswig Schles found there was a sceptical generation of Germans who took part in the war when they were very young and who then went on to build up the Federal Republic. They rejected all grand ideas. Their state religion became Karl Popper's piecemeal social engineering, the politics of small measures. Turn a screw here. Carefully open a valve there. Make sure not to create too much hope. <laughs> I just, I mean, if that's not Angela Merkel, I, I don't know what is. But isn't that fascinating? Don't create too much hope. And, well, I think that's bracing for us in this next stage. And I've also turned to another group who might surprise you, the world of Judaism and the Jewish people who, after all, had to also totally restructure their belief system, their identity in the first century after the sack of the temple. One of the guiding principles of that community's strength here and overseas, and I know it's totally tested all of, all of, even now, is summarised by that wonderful late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs with that phrase of his, the invitation to belong before believing. It's so seductive, that. Uh, and... You know, it just continues when I use it. I use it recently in an interview with um, Professor Ian Hickey, 
um, when he came on my show. And, you know, it just stops the show. But I've actually gone to those Jewish friends of mine and asked them, where does the life lie? That's what I sort of said. Where does the life lie? Don't give me, I don't want to know all, all the, um, the traditional structures. Um, and I know it's a very tight social group or, you know, cultural group, not quite like the sprawling, uh, wondrous but challenging Catholic Church. Um, and I know there's lots of different uh, strands, but, you know, they gave me some interesting answers, the perceptive ones. They say that while rabbis and shul are still the symbolic core and known to be, the real locus of energy and commitment is in secular jury. Now, that benefits the individuals concerned and the broader collective. Um, my Jewish friends say Jews had to enable their own group to survive because they knew no one else would do it, which is, again, very uh, pertinent, I think. So they had to work out what was required. And they suggested to me that the maintenance of doctrine as such was less emphasised or worried about. What preoccupied them was engagement. In fact, rabbis associated with Jewish schools are said to be responsible for Jewish life, which I think is a broader, subtly broader concept than what our, brief, our chaplains are briefed by. They set up all sorts of committees and so on to embody the values of Judaism more than the stated beliefs. Now, I find that very inviting. And uh, a big driver of these Jewish groups is engagement before fundraising, persuading people that Jewish community vibrancy is in their individual and family interests. The projects chosen by these various communities were understandable, not abstract, based rather more on action than explicit and stated beliefs. So look, I, I, I could go on, but I'll try not to be. And, and I had real, well run and sustainable to encourage younger capable people to take part. Look, I suppose I feel that one of the things that Pope Francis, he does, he's got some very good lines, you know. He says, um, uh, I do sometimes feel that I see in Christians that their, their lives look like um, Lent without Easter. <laughs> There's no, the defeatism is a grey pragmatism. And he sort of says, you know, get involved. And I sometimes think he doesn't actually know the busyness that is the, the sort of semi-curse for lay people. Um, and I noticed my London Tablet magazine, which is very good on this, um, in their parish practice section where they offer both philosophy and specifics. Recently, they put it the way I loved. Respect the busyness of the lives of those in your parish and affirm the many ways in which the busy life is made holy. One of their good writers is a nun, Sister Gemma Simmons, and she pleaded for the development of a language that would speak of spirituality in a way that would be accessible to the contemporary world, maybe five minutes of time alone with the will of God amidst the 24-7 calls. Well, I tell you, we'll have to develop that because we won't get that guidance for the church. So, look, I just think, I know my Jewish friends would say, look, stop talking about it. I know you think you snatch, like you snatch at a, at a, at a contemplative life. Just do it. Show it can be done, and then the words will come, and young people will see this. So that's my work in progress. Well, many thanks, Doreen, and to both of you for your terrific introductory papers. So we come to questions and discussion. We'll finish no later than the top of the hour. If you want to get into, uh, as I said earlier, uh, which is on the email that was sent to you this morning as to how to get in, can I just start off by asking both of you for a quick response? Um, What's gone hand in hand with what you've described in, in recent times is would be an increase in secularism, but of the sneering kind. I mean, there's a lot of sneering secularists around. Many of them are former believers, some former Catholics, some former other Christians, um, some not. This is, as you know, it's not directed at Islam. It's not directed at Buddhism. It's not even directed at Judaism, but it's directed at, at Christianity. So, Andrew and uh, Jordan, does it make a difference? Does it really matter? Should it be contested? Should it be just part of life? Does it matter? Right. Andrew, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I totally agree with you, Jared. There is a sneering tone to a lot of uh, uh, criticism. 
even legitimate critiques, I think, of the, uh, the institutional churches are shot through with a very sneering tone. Uh, I don't really think that you can do anything more than do what the Christian does and bear it. Um, to be honest with you, I don't really think there's, there's anything more that you can do. I think in the long term, it says more about the sneerer uh, than the subject. Um, I, but as I, I say again, though, I've also noticed on the flip side that many critics of the Christian church and particularly the Catholic church speak with much more sorrow than anger. In the United States, I think the second biggest group are those calling themselves lapsed Catholics. But funnily enough, they still want to use the term Catholic. They are still have a sufficient, a sufficient emotional connection to that their past to want to have that as part of their identity. But it, it won't satisfy people, I think, who want to be triumphant about their religion to hear me say, uh, I think you just have to accept the the um, the sneering as part of the cross that you've got to bear. Or Andy, want to make a comment? Yeah, well, um, look, I think it's just starting to, and this COVID hasn't hurt this at all. Um, I was really struck by this, Ian Hickey and um, James Lachlan are doing this podcast called Minding Your Mind. They've done it for about six weeks, designed to help people through the COVID. And they asked me to come back after Ian spoke because he was talking about the importance of the collective. We've got to start, you know, there's been too much focus. He, he agrees in psychology about the individual and he needs to be much more of the collective on which he did his doctorate. And I said on air, well, of course, the great religions did that. And he said, yes, yes, quite. Please come. And, and then they rang and said, please come and talk to us. And we It'll go out next week. A very interesting podcast, the three of us. He was raised solidly Catholic. He is now really pausing to think about the great psychological gems contained in a lot of the great religions. Now, he doesn't want a lot of God talk. That's true. But I feel that um, believers who've hung in there have probably become pretty fit <laughs> Otherwise, you're out of it. And maybe you do uh, not need to evangelise because it's taken within. There's a certain con there is a certain confidence, oddly enough, amidst the sneering. And I think it be can be, in its own way, especially if you don't really seek to do it, can be quite seductive. Okay, so thanks uh, to both of you. So... Go to Anthony, but, but then we go to Alan, but you've got to be all pretty brief. Yep, Anthony. Yes, the uh, Christian concept is that we are sinners, but our sin, sin can be forgiven if we are truly sorry, and uh, thereafter we can be redeemed. Uh, do you think many Australians who have lost their Christian faith while still retaining a belief in sin, uh, demonstrated by various woke issues, and if that, this is the case, may this mean that those deemed to be sinners under the new uh, situation have little prospect of redemption? There's no mechanism for redemption. Well, I don't think I know the religion where there's no mechanism for, rede for redemption. <laughs> I, I just don't. I mean, it's, uh, it's so fundamental that forgiveness is so fundamental to the tradition I was brought up in, um, I mean, in some ways, it's part of what slayed the Catholic Church. They were ready to forgive and, of course, look the other way. Don't get me wrong. A lot of those priests who fell so badly with uh, child abuse because of the readiness that people can always be redeemed. So, look, I, I just, I don't, I can't answer you because I don't recognise that faith. Um, uh, Anthony, there is a place, however, there is a religion um, which doesn't afford any forgiveness, and it's called social media. And I'm not joking there, because it, there are so many critiques now that have taken on, that point out that social media has taken on the characteristics of religion with canons and tenets that you cannot violate. But of course, there's no forgiveness in that uh, situation. I mean, one of the interesting things that occurs to me um, 
if you look, for example, at the political left, which traditionally always had uh, supposedly a more capacious view of who can be forgiven, uh, a, a, a notion in which, um, you know, uh, of redemption of the criminal and of the offender. And what do we now see? But the least forgiving people are those mm. on the cultural left of politics. The least forgiving people are those on the cultural left of politics. Um, and that, I think, is driven by the characteristic of social media. Yes, I always say that one of the things, mercy, you know, one of the, like, people didn't thought that, in fact, the whole so, uh, public conversation without, a lot of people think with that, the whole public conversation without church people being involved is, you know, all for the better. And I say, well, you know, this will, there'll be something that you, you will regret its absence completely. And one of the things that I think is so completely missing is the quality of mercy. Um, it's, it's, and no one, to, no one talks like that, uh, except um, the religions. Alan. Thanks, Jared. Um, Geraldine finished on spirituality and my question is about spirituality. Um, I wonder if what our commentators think about this observation that um, while fewer and fewer people are going through the doors of churches, more and more people are claiming to be spiritual people. And that perhaps, and I, I'm only really familiar with the Protestant wing of Christianity, I'm wondering if where Christianity has gone wrong and where it's lost some of its relevance is, that, is because it's perhaps become embarrassed by its spiritual side, it's become apologetic in rationalist terms, always wanting to explain things, and it just is not prepared to hesitate and publicly own the very spiritual side that is really part and parcel of Christianity in its full, in its full measure. I, I frankly agree with you. Uh, I, I think you're right. Uh, it, it's tricky, this, because a lot of the, I can see that a lot of the uh, routines and rituals that we inherited, you know, Christ the King, but you, you wouldn't know this, but this was huge, used to be a huge gathering, Christ the King, the Feast of Christ the King. This was in a, that whole triumphalist, you know, we sang Faith of Our Fathers, October the 25th, as I recall. A lot of things, and we sort of thought, oh, my God, what was all that about? And a lot of that was dropped, you know, fish on Friday or no meat, all these sorts of things. And it, it's there is a real tension. There has been a real tension in the, in the Catholic Church over in, in, since Vatican II because a lot of those have become meaningless and, of course, the, the Jewish uh, community absolutely deals with this sort of thing and wrestles with it all the time. Do you renovate? Do you renovate so much you actually, you, you, it loses all colour and becomes useless and then it doesn't stand for anything? So th this, this is, I think, a very clear and present issue. Andrew, do you want to comment there? Yeah, yeah very briefly, because it's a very good uh, point, Alan. Um, the... The danger, I think, with indulging uh, too much of the idea of spiritual but not religious is that we end up with a kind of values-free sort of Christianity. It's interesting the Canadian sociologist Rodney Stark argues uh, with some uh, statistical justification that it's those churches that have remained not so much rigid but quite faithful to their doctrine that have tended to survive, whereas churches that have become, uh, let us say, post-1960s uh, seeking to totally accommodate all forms of social change have the, are the ones that have suffered. Um, the question of spirituality, I, I'm not entirely sure how, how, how I would tackle that. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I seek... In just personally, I seek concrete forms of Christian expression, which is why I'm an Anglican of the uh, middle to high church style. Um, you know, it's funny in Sydney, if you say that you're an Anglican um, who believes in the prayer book, hymns, the altar and vestments, you're seen as something terribly heretical uh, among Sydney Anglicans. They wouldn't know what, what you're talking about. Um, but to me, that gives material expression uh, to my Christianity. Um, I think the notion of, of spiritual but religious is a religious, sorry, spiritual but not religious is a potential mission field for Christian churches. Uh, but at the same time, 
I think they have to be, I think they have to be vigilant in not abandoning a sense of values and all doctrine. You go, I go back to the concluding comments that I make. You have to find a way to make your doctrine pastoral. You have to find a way to make your doctrine compassionate, but you still have to find a way to adhere to your doctrine. I'm sorry if that's an inadequate answer. No, it's not. Um, Robin, it's Simons. Robin? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, question to, I guess, well, to both, but uh, Andrew in particular. I was interested in the comments about the United States. Uh, I was in America in November 2016, and the divide in the Christianity, Christian perspective from the country was stark. How do you bring together the Christian concepts as uh, in Boston, typ typified by Boston where I was, which was in a state of mourning as the result, with the Christianity of the Mike Pompeos of this world, who will, um, who I heard recently on video um, speaking in a pastoral event and peppering every second uh, sentence with uh, adulation of President Trump, etc. That's a slight exaggeration, but there's this politicization and how do you bring those very, very different two countries, as it were, together? Oh, uh, well, you've asked the impossible because I, <laughs> I can't tell you, Robin, but it's a very good point about how you bring um, those two Americas together. I can say, though, that you raise some really important points about the way that Christianity has been appropriated by one side of politics in the United States to Christianity's great disadvantage. Um, you know, a, look, I attend, just on a personal level, I attend a parish, there's about 80 to uh, 90 people in the parish. It's very much focused on public service where, you know, it's in Burwood, it's an Anglican parish. We're now considered a major community service provider because we feed 600 people a week. Um, Christianity that seeks, I think, a partnership with power, as some forms of American Christianity does, is very corrosive to the faith. A Christianity that is adheres to its values, but is a Christianity of service, is the one that has the longer term future. Um, the one thing, and as I say, I'm not someone who has this visceral reaction uh, against the Prime Minister when he, when we see glimpses of his religious practice or belief. The one thing that does discomfort me slightly was when he declared on election night, "I've always believed in miracles." because it did imply that there was, that his election victory was an expression of divine providence. And I think that's, I don't know that he explicitly meant to do that, but I think that is an unwise thing to do. Um, we fortunately in this country don't have the same mobilization um, as they do in the US of some Christian churches. Uh, you know, the, the Australian Christian lobby in Australia, perfectly entitled, by the way, to press its case, perfectly entitled to press its case. But the Australian Christian lobby does not have the same heft and power and influence as some of its, um, uh, uh, you know, um, fraternal organisations in the United States. And I think ultimately that is to the benefit of Christian churches. We're going to go to Anne. Anne? Okay, sorry. I have to sit here because of our setup. Um, I'm coming to this a bit of a long way around. Um, growing up a Catholic in Australia, I never felt that I was part of a really strong force in the sense that we were um, on top. We were always the underdog. And I think a lot of Jewish people have a similar feeling that you were pressing up. And I think one of the successes of the Catholic Church was that it was, in a sense, a frontier thing out here in Australia building its churches against the political odds and whatever. And to some extent, the crisis that's come upon it now is, to my thinking, the crisis of success. And we grew up with our catechisms and we grew up with our rituals and we grew up with our so-called faith, but we never actually had, like my mother did, to, to embrace it as a convert, to, to come to it as an adult and say, this is what I believe. We just said, I believe, because our parents told us we did. To what extent does this crisis that we're going through, in a sense it is a bit of a crisis, a really a, a cleaning out and an, a, a time that we can actually turn it round and, and ask 
people to find a reason why religion and Christianity, whatever religion, it doesn't worry me, but why that sense of um, the higher power, the notion that we're not just simply human matter, that we can make religion stronger again. Well, Anne, I mean, that is... (laughs) That is the, the, the issue at hand. I mean, I, I grew up in that same church you did, and I both had a very strong sense of identity, the tribe that, that Andrew's spoke about, um, and, but certainly it was emerging into power and influence, um, massively so. And, you know, there are very strong views by very significant priests in, in our land who, believes, who believe that, you know, the engagement by, with the Emperor Constantine right back in the third century was where everything started to go wrong. And that, that in fact, um, which is different to what you're saying, you're saying that didn't happen in Australia, but that that whole, that was the aspiration. That was the aspiration that you would affect the course of events by your ability to um, uh, to influence, to bring your values to bear. But of course, it's, it's, a, it's a, a juggling act. Look, I think that what Andrew was saying, that business of applied um, beliefs is so important, which has been happening in the Catholic Church, um, but smaller cabals of volunteers have done some just magnificent work. And in a way, a much bigger request, I think, is now being needs to be made of, dare I say, middle class Catholics. I mean, we've got this huge plenary council coming up and it is amazing. I'm just looking at the figures. It's involved 222,000 participants. It's generated 17,457 submissions. Like people care. People. There's a huge debate in in the people who bother to turn up and are interested to say, is this really going to change anything? Will the bishops ever listen? You know, they're into a a monarchical style where it's got to be broader with a lot of that um, belief you're talking about that it's worth engaging. But that is right now, that is what is being tested. Uh, That's one of the reasons I said yes to you tonight, Jared, because I thought, look, the more this is ventilated, ahead of that plenary council, the better, because I think a lot is being asked of precisely us now. Yeah, I'll just just add one thing there, by the way, and um, I I did like your observation about uh, Catholics as the underdog status, but this is a um, a chat I've had. One of the great joys of my life is to be friends uh, with um, John McCarthy QC, a very wonderful man who was our ambassador to the Vatican. And um, John and I have had this debate for years. I said, but hang on, John, from the late 1800s, the Catholics developed a parallel aristocracy. What do you think Xavier College and and, uh, and John's College? And what do you think uh, Riverview? What do you think all those um, Catholic law firms were about? Uh, I I think you're understating, Anne, the the, the level of of influence that um, the Catholic Church has had. Okay, now we've got time for a very quick comment from Ellen and a quick response from both of our speakers. Ellen. I'm sorry, Frank, I should have said. Frank, yeah. We can't hear you. Um, You're you're right. Yeah, we're right now. Yeah, okay. Um, It's obviously not Frank, it's... It's not, it's Mrs. Frank, so there we are. Okay. (laughs) Um, Geraldine and Andrew, bless you both, whenever I feel that I can't cope with the level of my personal religion, I'll tune in and get a dose from one or two of you, (laughs) get get a fix then. But I think the thing that also concerns me, in all the big churches, the leaders are not participating in the society at large. We used to, they used to be speakers who were called upon when there was any serious issue. Now they stay within their enclave and we don't hear from them. And if the... Well, you're breaking up a bit there, but I think we can we conclude by saying the question is that where are the strong, yeah. where are the strong religious leaders? They seem to be, they seem to be away from the public sphere. Where are they? That's, I think that's the question. So final quick comments about leadership. Yeah. Well, uh, let's go with Andrew. We'll finish with Geraldine. Yeah, Sue, that's a very good point. Uh, you and I uh, 
talk a fair bit about uh, common interests we have in the Anglican Church in Sydney. Part of the problem, for example, in Sydney is that, um, you know, let's be frank, Sydney, it is the last bastion of sectarianism in Christendom. I'm convinced of it. Um, uh, you know, for all its intellectual rigour, I have to say to you, you still can't get an Anglican bishop in Sydney to attend a Catholic mass. And if they do, they leave at the start of what's known as the propers of the mass. Um, I mean, Peter, uh, 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 you know, Peter Jensen, who's a, a very fine man and a very fine intellect, but uh, Peter would go to periodic masses at um, St. Mary's Cathedral and he would slip out before what's called the propers of the mass began. Um, you know, it's very, Sydney Anglicanism, I think, is troubled by its failure to, to break out of a certain sectarianism. If uh, Christian churches are to become bold and confident minorities, they also have to recognise the common interests they have with other faiths. The Catholic Church has recognised this. To some extent, the Eastern Orthodox churches have recognised this, that there, are, that there are common interests with our Muslim friends, our Jewish friends, our Hindu friends, our Sikh friends, and we must see them as friends. We must, the vast majority of Muslims, for example, are not jihadists, they're not Islamists. Many of those Muslim families are conventionally small C conservative families with great aspirations for their children, especially mm -hmm. their daughters and their education. They have, uh, they have uh, common fa values committed to the family. Our religious leaders, have to speak, I think, with less division. And this has been the thing that's held them back. This has been the thing that's held a lot of Christian leaders back, a certain sectarianism that persists. And it is particularly so on the Protestant side. The Catholic and, and Eastern Rite churches and Orthodox churches have been open to this, although uh, I'm married to, uh, my wife is a practicing Anglican, but she's baptized Greek Orthodox. I have to tell you, I'm still not welcome at Greek Orthodox. Um, uh, I'm always welcome in the church, but I'm not welcome to present for communion. But nonetheless, um, you know, it is it has to be an ecumenical recognition of common interest. Uh, well, um, look, it's about, I have a slightly different view. I actually wish they were capable of speaking about things of the secular world drawing on the tradition. I remember actually Peter Jensen, do you remember he had, for, he went, oh, this is years ago now, he had a lot to say about um, about penalty rates and about working conditions. He did, I've 15 always years that, ago. Yeah, yeah. I've, and I thought it was one of his finest hours, candidly. Um, uh, he'd researched it, he made sense. Look, they they won't, they, they, none of them will talk, talk about work. The incredible challenges involved in living a decent life and living by gospel values at work these days mm. for a lot of us. I'd love more guidance mm. about that. So actually, I, I I think they're grossly absent. Mark Coleridge, Archbishop Mark Coleridge, who's really been behind this plenary summit synod, he's very good, you know. He is really capable. He's a really big scripture scholar, of course, very fine scripture scholar. I My instinct is if they have studied the tradition, they do it well. They can tap into something. If they're just of the present moment and the present dilemmas, it's useless. Yeah. And that's, we're right on time. So many thanks both to Andrew and, and to Geraldine for a great discussion. Uh, we'll publish their papers, and will publish their papers in the Sydney Papers online soon. And, uh, and of course, we've had our discussion tonight. So I'll be very brief. Um, I've always held the view, and I've expressed it publicly on occasions, that Andrew and Geraldine are two of Australia's best interviewers by far because they actually listen to what people are saying yep. rather than think of the next question or the next comment they're going to make. And we've seen that again tonight. Uh, they've both listened to comments and questions. They've responded. They've, they've started off with great papers and we've had a very good, good discussion on the topic of Christianity today, a time of crisis, and uh, we can take, take away from the discussion our conclusions. But tonight, the Sydney Institute... Anne and myself and the team here are very grateful and thank you very much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure.